Hello there and welcome to Yodo. I'm Dr. Sarah Bohm and today I'm going to begin a discussion of the few of the many various types of connective tissue diseases. Many of these are not a typical cause of a person to be receiving palliative care and there are not many that are a typical cause for a person to be receiving hospice care. That being said, there are certainly patients with connective tissue diseases that can certainly benefit from palliative care and some connective tissue diseases can result in in-organ damage so severe that that organ system reaches the last stage of an illness and they do require hospice care. Because of a question from a viewer, this topic has been bumped ahead of others that were planned. I did try to put this up as one video, but after my editor reviewed this, I was advised to break this up into smaller pieces. It is a lot of information. This video will cover broadly about connective tissue basics, where connective tissue is in the body, what it does, and how to take care of yourself when something goes wrong. Then I will have other information with regard to specific connective tissue diseases that are inherited and some connective tissue diseases that are mixed covering autoimmune related processes. I do want to remind you that I'm not a specialist in rheumatology or connective tissue diseases. I am a dual board certified physician in both family medicine and hospice and palliative medicine. Thus this information is from that perspective. Now for some basics. Connective tissue diseases are chronic illnesses, and there are treatments of variable success available for many of these, but not a curative measure. The information here is in regard to basic disease characteristics and what advanced stage of the disease may look like. It is not intended to guide people to a diagnosis or a treatment plan, and therefore does not suggest any type of workup or lab or medications. If you're having issues, please follow up with your primary physician for direction. As you will soon see, this is a huge topic and specialists that are knowledgeable in these illnesses and the intricacies of connective tissue diseases is needed. I want to give you a bit of background and anatomy. Connective tissue is throughout our body. It is a cell type that makes up the tissues in the spaces between the cells. Connective tissue supports, cushions, surrounds, insulates, and connects. It is literally everywhere and makes up the structure of our body. Connective tissue plays an important role in the function of the body and in some instances, it defines the role of a particular organ system. It is present in and a very important part of each organ of the body. It is important for proper body and organ structure as well as organ function, body movement and flexibility, plus the necessary molecules that are made by connective tissue cells are used every day. Connective tissue provides a framework for the inside and outside of our cells. The specific form, function, and products made by the connective tissue cells varies based on the organ that it's associated with or around, and so does the specialized function that the connective tissue performs. These cells and the molecules they produce not only provide the physical structure of our body and the organs, but they also play an important role in our physiologic function of our body. The most rigid or firm connective tissue of the body is bone tissue. Bones are just one of the many classes of connective tissue and they provide the framework of our body. Bone tissue also makes our blood cells a very specialized class of connective tissue. In addition to bones and blood and other specialized connective tissue cells, we include cartilage, tendon, and ligaments. Cartilage provides cushion, structure, and forgiveness to protect the bones from rubbing on other bones and provide cushion from injury. Tendons and ligaments attach bones to bones or bones to muscles or muscles to bones. Fascia is the lining around our organs, sort of the skin of the organs themselves. Your abdominal organs have fascia around them as well as being around and between the muscles of the body, like a sleeve. It surrounds the brain and it has, you have peritoneum that kind of holds your abdomen in place and fascia comes in superficial, deep, and visceral forms. Molecules that you're likely familiar with include collagen, fibrin, and elastin. These are a few of the products that connective tissue cells make and they also fall into the class of connective tissue. They help your body have form, yet be flexible and resilient. Thus you see, connective tissue might be inflexible or stretchy, rigid or bendy. It enables us to stand up while also allowing us to have our tissues pulled or stretched without tearing or rupturing easily. 
Generally speaking, symptoms from connective tissue diseases appear at different times of life, depending on the disorder itself. Symptoms typically begin slowly and develop over time. Most of the time, it's over months to year. It can be over a shorter period of time, but not typically. Many times, it's the smallest joints that are involved the earliest. The joints of the fingers and hands typically are the first involved. Most common symptoms of connective tissue diseases are pain, stiffness, and swelling. Connective tissue, just like any other part of our body, is subject to the change of time with normal wear and tear possibly occurring, but with connective tissue diseases, that wear and tear that might be normal is advanced much more rapidly than anticipated for other people. And if an injury has occurred or someone has been extremely active and has a connective tissue disorder, of course, that wear and tear advances more rapidly. Today, I will introduce a few of the many connective tissue disorders, just an introduction, because there are many connective tissue disorders that are related processes. You may already be thinking ahead and think that you know some connective tissue diseases, just as I've gone over these cell types and some of the locations. Symptoms that are common, not only pain and joint swelling, but the joint swelling can occur with or without joint deformity. And that's one of the predominant symptoms for each of the connective tissue disorders. This can be across an entire spectrum from mild to severe. Joint inflammation with swelling is really typical. Swelling can be disproportionate to pain severity. Pain is common with joint movement, but can be present at rest. Joint mobility and range of motion are also often affected. In most conditions, joint range of motion is limited, but in a few connective tissue diseases, it's actually increased. Joint stiffness is another common feature. Gelling phenomenon can occur in some patients. Without activity, such as while seated during a meal or watching TV, and certainly while being in bed at night, a person can wake up with initial stiffness when they begin to move again after that period of inactivity. For some patients, it can last an hour or more first thing in the morning or after they first begin to move again. Gelling is caused by the inactivity of a joint, allowing fluid to collect in the cartilage and in the joint space. During periods of inactivity, the cartilage becomes sort of waterlogged and the fluid in the joint begins to thicken. Think of thick paint that has sat for a period of time and needs to be stirred up to get it moving again. The problem is that the joint is already sore and now with the extra swelling of the joint, the waterlogged cartilage and the joint fluid all getting congealed, restarting that movement is even more difficult and more painful than usual. Another common symptom for some can be a phenomenon called Renaud's. Renaud's is when the fingers get exposed to cool temperatures or cold temperatures. Those fingers will rapidly chill and they chill abnormally and they stay cold longer than they do for other people. The fingers and the hands often become discolored, turning very pale or white. Sometimes they can even look like they're blue in color but this discomfort and those cold fingers are associated with these renowned symptoms. Simply just getting into the refrigerator, certainly the deep freeze when carrying a cold object and definitely going out into cold weather can trigger these Renaud's events. Many patients will have attacks of Renaud's and will learn over time not to carry a cold object without gloves. Lastly, there are numerous general symptoms associated with connective tissue diseases, such as those related to poor sleep, increased fatigue, and certainly mood issues such as depression or anxiety are common. Some patients experience appetite and weight changes. Abdominal symptoms of pain or bowel issues are common. Many patients have anemia at the time of diagnosis and even while being treated, their anemia may continue and it may not resolve. Some of these conditions carry a higher risk for skin changes, such as skin changes, thickening, skin rashes, and hair loss. Although these chronic disease processes are progressive, they are treatable. The advancing changes can be slowed, so it's important to identify the disease early. Each of these diseases can certainly impair a person's mobility and reduce the number of pain-free days for a person over time. In many years of having connective tissue disease, the disease affects not only their activity and their mobility and resulting in, in daily pain, but it can result in unsatisfactory lifestyle choices. 
Unfortunately, some connective tissue diseases do have a direct effect to cause shortened life expectancy. The damage caused by some of these diseases results in injury to an organ system specifically. It could be direct or indirect damage. The end organ, whether it's kidneys, heart, lung, or vascular system, then dictates the characteristics of that patient's end of life. The first group of connective tissue disorders that we're going to go over in the next video will be those that are inherited and run in families. And there are many diseases that fall into this particular category of connective tissue, but I'm only going to go over a few of the more common ones. Ehlers-Danlos, Marfan's, and osteogenesis imperfecta will be the ones that we discuss in this class. The next set of disorders that we'll talk about are the mixed connective tissue diseases. Mixed connective tissue diseases have an autoimmune cause. Some of these do have a genetic predisposition as well, but they're classified a bit differently than those in the inherited group. The few autoimmune-mediated connective tissue diseases that I'm going to go over include lupus, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, Sorgren syndrome, and rheumatoid arthritis. These are some of the more common and well-known connective tissue diseases there is a lot of information available, and so I'm going to do that in a separate video. The next video will go into more detail regarding some of the health risks associated with each of these mentioned here. Certainly there are treatments to slow these disease processes, but once the joint damage or the organ damage has occurred, there's not a medication to return that and return that bone or cartilage or ligament or organ system to an undamaged state. Thus, the importance of early recognition and correct diagnosis with good treatment and the appropriate medication that the patient tolerates is imperative. As with other disease states, if permanent damage occurs, it does not matter how we got here. We need to do the best that we can to proceed forward to have the best days possible. As the disease state advances over time, the patient will experience a progression of each of the symptoms they've already been having and possibly some new ones will arise. Over time, there is often an increased risk to the internal organ systems that the specific disease poses the highest risk to. Thus, for many patients, they will often have several physicians that they are being followed by and having to go to see regularly. The goal is to keep the patient as healthy and as active as possible and mitigate the symptoms limiting their life as best we can. Please watch for the next video about connective tissue diseases. Thank you for forwarding the information to others and I appreciate you helping the channel grow by subscribing. If you have a topic that you would like to discuss or a question that you want to answer, please leave it in a comment below. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you staying with me through this so far. It has been a difficult one to listen to. I know this because my editor has told me so. You deserve a cookie, but instead have an apple this time. For those of you that have been interested, I also have a cat update on my cataract procedure. Both eyes have had cataract replacement now, and I'm really pleased with the vision in my left eye, and I'm happy with the vision in my right. The right eye is not as far along as the left, and I am hopeful that the right eye will continue to improve as I learn to use that new lens. I'm right eye dominant, so I'm really hopeful that that eye will become as good as the left eye is. It's been a really interesting process for me, and I hope I've shared some valuable information to you. Live each day to the best. Bye now.